the Prince now joins his officers in Duddingston to discuss the news of Sir John's landing. The decision they make is unanimous. They must give battle. And so the two armies march on. The Redcoats advance to Haddington with cannon, foot and horse. They make a proud sight as they cross the East Lothian landscape. And the Prince, meanwhile, pauses, for he has spotted the bonniest lasses he has yet seen in Scotland. And he gives Beatrix and Mary Jenkinson tokens of their momentous meeting. Sir John Cope now is off the main road, crossing onto the flatter coastal plains as he approaches the village of Preston Pans. Charles now leads his men over the Roman bridge at Mosselburgh, urging them on with stirring words. And they pass through Inveresk and up onto the high ground near to Trinent. But seeing the Highlanders on the hillside, Sir John's men now wheel around their battle lines. And when the men of Clan Cameron fire down upon them from Trinent Churchyard, Cope's cannons fire back. These are the first shots of the Battle of Preston Pans. Unwilling to suffer casualties to no purpose, the Camerons wisely abandon the churchyard. There would be no battle, in fact, on this day. An impassable marsh separates the two armies, and that prevents a downhill charge. But Robert Anderson of Whitborough knows a way around, and he informs the Jacobite officers. And as night draws in, the prince examines the track which leads to Riggan Head, and beyond that, to the east of Sir John Cope's camp. He begins to form his plan of battle. But Sir John Cope is taking no chances, and places 500 men on sentry duty. Nervous soldiers hear dogs barking in the distance, and they wonder what could cause such disturbance. It's the Highlanders, leaving at four o'clock in the morning on the 21st of September, 1745, their army advances into the darkness. The sentries soon hear the sounds of the advancing enemy. They cry out in challenge, and a gun fires to raise the alarm. Rushing to arms, the Redcoats form in their ranks, the officers smoothly wheel the battle lines to face the unexpected threat appearing from the east. In the brightening morning, the two armies form across the plain, and after all these weeks of marching and manoeuvres, they will finally have their battle. As the sun rises behind them, dispersing the light mist on the field, the Highlanders snatch a quick moment of prayer. Before launching their terrifying charge, swords bared, pipes skirling, the Highlanders surge towards their enemies. Cope's gunners flee from the frightening spectacle, leaving their shocked officers to fire the cannons alone. With flashes of flame and bursts of thick smoke, the cannons fire into the oncoming Jacobites. The sounds of the guns awaken the local people, who seek the best views of the battle from the ruins of Preston Tower. Whilst the furious charge surges into the abandoned cannons, shattering the redcoat flank. Colonel Whitney endeavours to charge with his dragoons, but he is shot from his horse. Stunned, the horsemen are now turning to flee. Now unsupported, Cope's gallant infantry open fire. Muskets blaze and smoke fills the field as the redcoats attempt to hold back the tide of charging clansmen. But when the charge hits home, the redcoats are simply unable to withstand the shock. The screams of the wounded fill the air, and the infantry break from their shattered ranks. Panicked and defeated, the British horsemen reach Bankton House, and their officers try in vain to rally their spirits. But the horsemen still seek their escape, and they block the road out of Preston Pants. And with that road blocked, the infantry are trapped against the walls of Preston House. There's no escape, and the slaughter here is terrible indeed. But some brave soldiers do attempt to make a stand. A local commander, Colonel Gardner, rallies them. But with a terrible slice, a Lacarbarax strikes him from his horse. And as the fighting dies down, the dying Colonel is found beneath a solitary thorn tree. His servant comes and places him upon a cart, dragging him to the Manse of Trinent. Whilst across the field at Kakenzie House, the baggage guard has surrendered too, and the victorious Highlanders have discovered Sir John Cope's military treasury. But Cope has no time to worry about that. With his surviving cavalry, he admits defeat, and he makes his escape towards Trinent. The triumphant prince calls his Highlanders to order, 
They have won for him a decisive victory. But he insists indeed that all prisoners are treated well and he calls for surgeons to attend the wounded of both sides. Although in Trinent Mance, nothing more can be done for gallant Colonel Gardner. Here he breathes his last under the care of the Jenkinson sisters. Meanwhile downstairs, victorious Highlanders are celebrating their bravery. Gardner's own home at Bankton House has now become a hospital and both Redcoat and Highlander are having their wounds treated too with care. Charles, having ensured that his orders were obeyed, withdraws now to Pinky House in Musselburgh. And the Robertson clan drag away Sir John Cope's carriage. All his goods, from his fur coats to his drinking chocolate even, are now the trophies of war. And Cope's men, those proud redcoats, begin the short but weary march to Edinburgh. Over a thousand soldiers, Scots and English alike, are now Prince Charlie's prisoners. This was the news which Sir John had to break to his superiors when he at last reached the safety of Berwick-upon-Tweed. Now Charles returns to Holyrood in triumph, but he avoids being seen to celebrate. But his men, however, show less restraint and they cheer on the streets of Edinburgh of the victory they've won for their prince and for King James. And in the royal palace, the nobles now flock to visit the glamorous rebel leader. Many of those who had scorned his cause now dance at his public balls. But the thunderous fire of cannons breaks the spell. Edinburgh's mighty castle yet remains in King George's hands and it refuses to surrender. Only by letting supplies into the castle can the prince silence those guns. In return, the castle releases the money held there for the Royal Bank of Scotland. Now, Charles can afford to continue his war, and his army is expanding daily. Soon over 5,000 men have flocked to the Prince's Banner, training with their weapons in Holyrood Park. Thus are the rewards of victory. The French too have renewed their support of Prince Charles, signing a great treaty and promising to send more troops. And with all things turning in his favour, Charles presses his council to make its most crucial decision yet. It was time, he said, to invade England and to march on London itself. And so it was, on the 1st of November 1745, the army marched out of Edinburgh and on into legend. It seemed that nothing now could stop them, these brave Highland warriors and their bonny Prince Charlie. The Prince's army advanced deep into the heart of England reaching Derby by December. He was less than a week from London now, and King George was on the brink of flight. But Charles' officers feared that there was a large army ahead, and still no French landing had occurred. To his bitter disappointment, they retreated. The initiative and the momentum were irretrievably lost. Charles's enemies pursued him back to Scotland, until, despite another significant victory at Falkirk, Charles was finally defeated in April 1746. Yet that final defeat can never erase the memory of Charles's great achievements. Long after he ceased to be a threat, his enemies still feared his name. No one would forget this remarkable prince with his hopes and his ambitions, but above all, none could ever forget his finest victory, his victory at the Battle of Prestonpans. <laughs>